David, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, Elijah, thanks for having me. All right. Now, I'd first like to discuss the price of gold. Now, we're seeing the price of gold around 1300 right now, but you say that really, eventually you see it going up by tenfold. Can you explain the reasoning behind this? Sure. Uh, I think, first of all, let everyone know that if you go into the archives or just Google engineering the price of gold by David Morgan, again, the uh, name of the articles, Engineering the Price of Gold by David Morgan. That was in the early 2000s. And it's a very simple, simple arithmetic problem. Basically, you take M1, the M1 money supply, and you divide it by the amount of gold purportedly held at Fort Knox. You do that simple division problem, and you come out with the paper price of gold. In that article, what I said was, if you do that math, and this was again in the early 2000s, where the money supply is about one fourth of what it is right now, the M1 money supply, it was around $2,500 a ounce. So at that time of the article, I said that the theoretical paper price of gold was $2,500 a ounce. But then I went on to say something far more important than that. And that is what do we have in recent history that supports that? And what we had was the peak of gold of January 21st, 1980. And if you did that same arithmetic, the same division, M1, the money supply, divided by the amount of gold purportedly held, it would come out for $400 a ounce. But the fact is it went to $850 an ounce, which means that we could have actually had a 100% fully backed gold currency in the United States of America. In fact, we could have done better than that because the paper price at that time was actually double. So what I went on to say and continued in that article, Engineering the Price of Gold, is that at times markets overshoot. In other words, undervalued, fair value to overvalued. Obviously, from that metric, gold was overvalued by a factor of two. It quickly came back down from that level. So I also suggested in this article that just because 2500 at that time, again, I'm talking in the 2000s, you could see $2,500 gold doesn't necessarily mean that it had to go to that level. It could go higher based on the previous history. So now we come to the question. Well, first of all, you can go back to Jim Rickards and you can see his math. He's very forthright about how he arrives at $10,000 gold. You go to Nick Barashev, he's very clear about how he gets to $10,000 gold. And then with my recent discussion with Mike Maloney of goldsilver.com, I explained that if you did the same math as before, and you divided the uh, M1 money supply by the reported amount of gold held by the Treasury, you would come out north of $10,000 an ounce. So that's my point. Now, does that guarantee it's going to get there? No, it does not. It also, as I said, could indicate in a panic, manic market, it could go higher than that. So this is what we've seen in the past. Uh, does it guarantee it in the future? It does not. But it's not a ridiculous number. In other words, you asked me to support it, so hopefully I just supported it by a very simple math problem. Definitely. Now, why is the gold held by the Treasury, why is that the amount of gold that's really important in this, uh, in your prediction? Well, because it's, you know, it answers the exact question. I mean, if you put on your Joe Friday hat, just the facts, ma'am, the facts are that you have this much M1, that's currency, and checkbook money, and you have this much gold. And so there's no argument. There's two facts there. And you just take these two facts, you put them together. And what are you asking? You ask, what is the dollar price of gold? You're not asking, what is the euro price of gold? Or what's the Canadian price, dollar price of gold? You're asking, what is the dollar price of gold, the US dollar price of gold? So that's the answer. Um, people can argue with me all day long, but you know, support it by different facts. You'd have to either change the purported amount of gold held by the treasury, or you'd have to change the M1 money supply reported by uh, the Federal Reserve. So, you know, it's pretty simple. Again, uh, I want to be clear, that doesn't guarantee that we're going to that level, but it does suggest it. And, you know, Mike Maloney and I have known each other for a very long time. And Mike has done, you know, excellent videos. I mean, the Hidden Secrets of Money series is phenomenal. And I mean, he didn't have to do that, but he did as a public service. And I, I want to do a public shout out for that. 
And in one of the early ones, he talks about every now and again when we get these huge distortions in the economic system, the financial system, that gold does an accounting, is how he states it, meaning that it does just does what I said. It accounts for all of the malinvestment, all of the money printing, all of this stuff that's gone on under QE, one, two, three, ad infinitum. Everything has taken place to distort the true nature of the real economy. And gold actually takes a place at some point and accounts for all those errors. And if you do that based on my metrics or the metrics, they're not mine, they're, they're facts, then you would come out with that number. So I think we've beaten that to death, but if there's more questions, I'd certainly take them. It's just, again, a support. In other words, as Jim Rickards does with the 40% backing of gold and gets his 10,000, he uses a different metric than I do. Nonetheless, both of us are supporting our theses with you know hard numbers that anyone can verify. Definitely. And as you were saying, back in 1980, it overshot by a factor of two. So it's not just $10,000 an ounce or so that we might be looking at. It might be maybe double that. It could. And it could go the other way. I mean, if you had a massive deflation in the bond market, which I certainly wouldn't rule out, and there's a bunch of money that goes to money heaven. In other words, it's just destroyed. And all of a sudden, the... Uh, M3, M2 money supply is, is, you know, curtailed a great deal. You might come out with a $5,000 an ounce. I don't know. What I'm trying to suggest is that there's a direct correlation between the amount of malfeasance that's continued in the monetary system since we severed our way away from gold in August 15, 1971 to present day. And at some point in time, there will be a day of reckoning. And it may not be a day. Uh, certainly, January 21st, 1980 was a one-day high, but uh, gold did stay around the $700 level for a while. <clears throat> then it backed off. Anyone can look at a chart. I don't have all the numbers in my head, but uh, the idea was that as it came off of that peak high, it still stayed in the range I'm talking about, where you could still have a full gold back coverage. And of course, that wasn't on the minds of anybody in you know, the Congress, Senate, or anywhere in the U.S. government. Nonetheless, it could have been achieved. Now, what about silver then? If we see this accounting happening, so the currency supply matches the value of the gold held at the Treasury, then where does silver uh, play in this, this equation? Well, that's a great question. Of course, you know, I'm kind of known to be focused more on silver than gold. So I actually addressed that same question in this article in during the price of gold. And I said, silver is harder to determine because it's not a monetary asset recognized by any nation state on the planet anymore, which means we kind of have to look at it from a rear view mirror perspective, which means that we're going to look at what does it normally trade at relative to gold as a, as a monetary asset, and that's 16 to 1 which if you do the math, then you can determine the price of silver. So you could take that 10,000, divide it by 16 or 20, divide it by 10. It would be uh, 1,000 divided in half again would be 500. That'd be a 20 to one ratio. So that's, uh, that's a, a number. I think a better way to, that, that's one way to look at it. I mean, certainly there's, there's no hard, fast, fact that I can give you like I just did on the gold, you know, paper price of gold. I think an interesting way to look at it, though, Elijah, is to look at the U.S. debt clock. On the debt clock, it states the U.S. dollar to silver ratio, the one-year increase in the U.S. M2 money supply divided by the yearly world production of silver and ounces. So that comes out to 631. If you take the year-over-year year increase in the U.S. M2 money supply divided by the yearly world gold production in ounces, it comes out to $5,000 per ounce. So there's lots of ways to measure this. There's lots of metrics, but most of these are based on real numbers, so you can have at it. But I think any metric you use from a balanced, objective perspective states clearly that gold is undervalued at this point in time. And silver is undervalued relative to gold because the ratio is up to like 76 to 1. 
Definitely. And I know um, you were recently talking about, um, and you've talked about this in the past, that you see the economy not doing well in the future, possibly a crisis coming. Now, how does this impact silver? Because you were recently on that interview with Mike Maloney, and you said that there will be low, because of the economic collapse that's coming, there will be lower demand for base metal, metal prices. And as we know, most of silver is mined out of the ground kind of, you know, by, with, by accident, just as a byproduct of these other base metal mines. So if there's less base metal being brought out of the ground because we see a lower economy, how is that going to impact the supply of silver? Well, it will impact it and could be significantly. Uh, you know, Mike was actually one that brought that up. I forget who said what to whom, but the point is valid that if you had a big contraction in the global economy, that there wouldn't be as much need for copper, for zinc, and for lead, and even 10% of the silver supply, supply as a result of gold mining. So basically 70% is there as a result of these base metals and gold mining. So if that's curtailed in any significant way, it would have a proportional amount of less silver being brought above ground. Only 25% or so is brought by primary silver producers. And even all primary silver producers are lead, zinc, and copper miners. Their primary asset is silver but or gold. You look at some of Hecla Mining's uh, portfolio of mines, you'll find that some are basically gold-silver mines, and they're barely, in some instances, silver mines. In other words, the amount of uh, dollars per ton are based more on gold than on silver. It's not a slight to heckle in any way, shape, or form. It just is illustrating the point that uh, that there's no such thing anymore as a, as a pure silver uh, asset on a, from a mining perspective. Even when the most closely uh, correlated uh, mines to silver to silver itself is uh, first majestic, and even they have you know, some dilution by other metals, if you want to think of it in those terms. Now, moving to, I want to get your perspective about um, just the recent movement in precious metal prices. So just kind of the short term. I know the last time we had you on, which was about a month and a half ago, you were talking about how gold was, you know, just uh, breaking through the 1350 level, which is really important. Now we've seen it pull back a bit. Where do you see gold and silver going from here? Well, it's frustrating. I mean, I am somewhat biased. I try to remain objective at all times. But the 1350 level is looking good for a while, obviously. It's backed off. From here, I think we're going to have more back and forth. It looks to me, based on the mining share activity, that we're probably hitting the bottom. Based on the commitment of trader activity, we're probably hitting the bottom. But that doesn't guarantee it. I think we're going to have kind of a lackluster market for a while longer. And how long is that, David? I don't know. I would think, though, that we may get into higher metal prices uh, within the next few months and three, four months. And why do I say that? Because of those two factors, the mining shares and the commitment of traders, and that the CPI is starting to ignite thinking along the inflation lines. We haven't seen that for a long time. But what the CPI showed in January is like 0.5%. You multiply that by 12, you got 6% inflation for the year. Remember, Richard, well, you don't remember, you're way too young. But uh, Richard Nixon put on wage and price controls when I think we had 5% inflation or 6%. So this is something that you won't see. Well, I wouldn't say you wouldn't see wage and price controls. What I'm trying to state is you're going to see more and more uh, people moving into this idea that, uh-oh, inflation is taking hold. I better do something about it. And those type of people will come back into the precious metals. All right. Well, David Morgan, thank you so much for joining us today. Before we go, I was interested in discussing just one last topic about uh, cryptocurrencies. And you have knowledge about a cryptocurrency that's being released that's actually backed by silver. And I was wondering if you could tell us about that. Sure. Well, basically, I'm favorable to the blockchain. I'm not that favorable to unbacked uh, blockchain assets, but there are some that are backed. Uh, there's one for the DRC that's uh, cobalt-based, backed in cobalt. It looks like it's being it's successful. 
This one that I'm referring to is, you put the uh, address in the show notes, but it's a blockchain based on silver. And it's a pretty interesting uh, concept. These people that I've uh, associated with have been looking at, you know, mon re-monetizing silver. It's called the Cryptographic Silver Monetary System. And it's building the world's first cryptographic silver monetary system utilizing blockchain architecture that will enable the creation and distribution of two tokenized assets, each representing a unique relationship to silver bullion. So both these coins or tokens are backed by real silver. And it's early stage. I would suggest people use the link in the show notes that you're going to provide to get on their newsletter. If you're an early adopter and you're willing to take the risk, the founding members that actually ship silver to the uh, to this company will have the opportunity to participate in rewards, which the rewards are in silver. But that's a high risk proposition. I'm not out here telling everyone that they could, you know, should do it or could do it or might do it. It's up to them, of course. But uh, I would be remiss not to mention it. But I think the best case for most people is to uh, just watch this as it develops. And then uh, once it's up and running, you know, continue to watch it for a while if you want to participate. Once it's what I call seasoned, in other words, it's actually functioning and working without many bugs or any bugs, then that's probably the opportunity to get a, go ahead and get involved. All right, David Morgan, thank you so much for joining us today. Before we let you go, are there any last thoughts you'd like to add and where can people find you online? Yeah, I think the best thing is for anyone that's interested in the resource sector, we cover all resources except oil and gas. <clears throat> you know, we've talked about cobalt and lithium and vanadium and the rare earth elements, the base metals, precious metals. We look at them all. Get on our free list, which is the morganreport.com. Just give me a first name and an email address. You verify that. And anything that comes up that's of interest to the community, like this uh, project I'm referring to on this silver-backed cryptocurrency, we put that out to uh, our free e-letter readers as well as our paid members. Of course, our paid members get a little more insight because obviously they're paying us and they get the best information. But we also provide you know, a great outline to everybody else that's on the free list. So I encourage anyone that's interested in starting to think maybe – Silver, precious metals, any of the resource sector, um, how to participate, you know, how do you invest in lithium? How do you invest in cobalt? I mean, these are questions that people ask us all the time, and there are ways to do it, but um, a lot of these quote-unquote investments aren't worth your time, money, or effort.